Marcus Lippert during his morning workout. 80 press-ups and a 10-kilometer run, his daily fitness regime. Although he can't arrest the aging process, he rigidly strives to retain his youthfulness. Mental and physical fitness forms the bedrock for his art, his painting and sculpture. After exercising comes the daily team meeting. Oil paints and the like are all there, no linseed oil. Oil paints, have we got the paints? What canvases do we have? What sizes? 130, 162? Then mount them onto the easels. Art is about surprising oneself, opening a door to see something you've never seen before. The fact I'm here at all is a miracle. Everyone dismissed Lüppert as a flash in the pan, destined to failure. But I've managed to outlive them all. Marcus Lippertz in his Dusseldorf studio. For the Vice-Chancellor of the Dusseldorf Art Academy, painting is the elite discipline. He combines abstraction and realism on his canvases as he does in life. I don't believe there's just one reality, but rather there are invented, dreamed, experienced, purported realities. What's happening outside, life as it actually is, is so banal that it's not worthy of mention. And we have to live with this deficiency, fill it with mysteries, stories, deceptions and labyrinths. Otherwise, what is there? You have to invent yourself in this world, create the world you wish to live in. If we lived our lives based purely on the fact that we exist, then what would be the point? His paintings serve as instruction manuals for perceiving the world. Video art and installations are of no interest to him. Experimenting in the tradition of painting, drawing and sculpture, he reveals himself on canvas with a passion, even aggression. And when he warms to a theme, he can immerse himself in it obsessively, producing a whole series of works. Perhaps when it's completely finished and dry, I'll shine a light on the bright surface. It may become lost in the transience of colour, but in principle, in terms of paint application and my understanding of painting, it's absolutely... Really hard work. Yes, I can't do it any other way. And why is that? I don't know. A failing of mine, probably. It's about mastering the materials, ultimately not being able to work systematically. I can only rely on myself, on what I've been blessed with. Everything else is opportunity, movement, impulse. I once observed that you have to be careful when painting, that you don't learn how to paint. You have to relearn everything with each new painting to avoid routine. Only this infinite belief that something will eventually emerge keeps you going. I've no guarantee that it'll work, because I don't keep to the rules. I don't adhere to any rules. And neither does he adhere to any rules when playing his beloved free jazz. Here in concert with Manfred Schorfs at Berlin's Academy of Arts, these professional musicians enjoy Lupertz's improvisations.
Exhibits, performances and actions are all organized by his team, all for Marcus and Marcus for all. This is in Berlin, Marcus, yeah? This is okay. This small studio kitchenette serves as his command center. It's also a repository of memories, memories of his former students. This place holds a special power. One can sense it everywhere. The walls are full of memories. Who was that guy? That was a student of mine. He did a series of Congo paintings. That one is a cruel mercenary leader. This is all the work of students. There's only one rival, and that's immortality. But that's something we don't determine in our own lives. That's imagination, that's mystery. If you view art as a necessity, as I do, sadly, or thank God, then art is my life. I can't think any differently. So, and that is a curse, viewed from that perspective, the world is free from rivalry because everything is done in the cause of art. And if someone else does it, then so can I. And if I do it, then so can someone else do it, providing the quality is there. Every artist who creates a great work enriches the work of every other contemporary artist. He's part of this great work. That's why in art there is, apart from these everyday commercial vanities, no competition. All made to measure. 120 pairs of shoes, 80 suits. That requires a lot of organisation. Jürgen Schmidt takes care of everything. Is chauffeur, butler, bodyguard, training partner, always on hand, 24-7. Jürgen, did you hang up the suits? Yes, they're all hung up. There's a new one among them. It needs altering in the leg. We'll see to it then. My role is to watch his back. It was Marcus who once observed that I just drifted into this job through our friendship. He just needs a guy who's loyal. Loyalty is what ultimately characterizes our relationship, our working relationship. When did things start in the mornings? Usually around 8 o'clock. We get up at 8, drink a cup of coffee, he usually starts with a sip of olive oil, and then we go for a run, and after that do some exercises. That's the surprising thing about him. The man is 65 years old. Where does he get his energy from? He has an enormous workload and does everything himself, be it a drawing or a sculpture. Apart from the welding of the amateur, of course, he personally takes care of everything. And it's the same with his paintings. Other artists have their work done for them, but not Lupert's. He's driven by some kind of inner energy, or madness, or genius. Maybe that's it. Irgendeine innere Kraft, denke ich, treibt ihn. Oder ein Wahnsinn. Oder ein Genie, ja? Kann ja auch sein. The terrible thing is that people are made to retire at 65. They then have another 30 years ahead of them, as what? And if they don't have the cultural, intellectual and educational resources to occupy their leisure time, one of the great achievements of a free society, then it can be hell on earth. Yeah. <laughs> Lupertz is not only a painter, he writes books, poetry, and is a much sought after speaker. The Max Beckman Society has invited him to deliver the inaugural address at the opening of the new Pinakothek Gallery in Munich. Marcus Lüppertz holds forth on the great German expressionist Max Beckmann. But rather than an academic lecture, the audience is treated to authentic Lüppertz, an address couched in his distinctive, highly idiosyncratic prose. Although the evening is dedicated to Max Beckmann, it is Marcus Lüppertz who steals the show.
Full power. Baby face. Loaf of bread. Horizons. Beaming holes of steel. Sitting mountain lascivious spoiled. A trough of memories. The grated grave. Cherry tree romanticism. Bleating. Lupatz is also represented in the Pinakothek as a painter. His neologisms and the unique style of his performance captivate the audience for over an hour. Back in Dusseldorf. Marcus Lupatz is always on the move, ideally on four wheels. This self-confessed car freak owns a dozen luxury marks. He selects the appropriate vehicle depending on the occasion, mood and weather. In the summer of 2006, the Vienna Art Forum staged a Lupatz retrospective. He himself prefers to refer to the exhibition as a comparison of work groups, paintings with sculptures and drawings. These are from the series of my favourite paintings. I'm particularly delighted about these frames because they embody the concept of perfection I had in mind. After completing these paintings, I then started experimenting, which ultimately resulted in these astonishingly beautiful works, which wouldn't have been created had I not changed tack. The section of Mozart's head and behind it the water lily, what sort of associations were running through my mind? And that's the exciting part. One, two, three, all different times from 1970 today and four years ago. I don't get to see my paintings often, but when I do, I'm always surprised by my own master. It's deeply satisfying. And I simply recognize that I'm an extraordinary painter because there is nothing comparable. Someone once asked me if I'd like to have lived in a previous century. I answered quite categorically, no. I'm a child of our time, a product of our time. I love this time and I hope I can help shape it and that when people talk of this time, they'll talk of me. I'm a fan of this time, a child of this time and love being of this time. And I hope that I'll remain so for as long as possible. The world of Marcus Lupertz encompasses many facets. He's been dubbed the Prince of Painters, a dandy, a genius, and his generosity is widely recognized. He enjoys his life as an artist and his extravagant lifestyle. He relishes the limelight, yet despite his flamboyant public appearances, it is his disarming directness which impresses. Is the world of Marcus Lupertz a stage? Is he always standing on stage? Is he always acting? That question is like a two-edged sword. Both answers, yes and no, would be correct. It's entirely arbitrary. It just depends upon how I feel. My mood is. It's not permanent. It begins with my deciding what to wear. I lay out my suits and choose a matching shirt, then the shoes. And finally, I select the car which goes with my attire. Is this acting? If you say so. I prefer to describe it as a short poem I've written to celebrate the day. You appreciate your life of luxury. It's said that you devote yourself to the sensual things in life, 
not only good cuisine. How do you see yourself in a society which is shaped by the media, by critics and by museum officials, all of whom are very important to you? How do you fit into this McDonald's society? How do you perceive yourself? Well, first of all, as not belonging to it, because my aesthetic standards are on a different level. I regret the lack of attention paid to one's appearance, mutual politeness and charm. I love eloquent speech, I love social gatherings and engaging in stimulating debate. And I love beautiful people, well-dressed people, standards. I started off at the bottom and am aiming for the top. And the top articulates itself for me in standards, standards which I myself strive to maintain with a certain degree of self-discipline. And with a certain financial investment, I attempt to communicate a quite specific aesthetic. I try never to let myself go out of politeness to my public. I despise people's vulgar indifference towards their own body, their own posture. This incorporates many things, extending even to my cars, my suits, my shoes, even to my shirt. And these things are important to me. And this is initially related to how you see your own paintings, how you develop your own aesthetic standards. For even if you fall below them, you still set them, draw attention to them. For example, I'm interested in picture frames, in the plinths for the sculptures. I can spend hours discussing what the plinth for the sculpture should look like, how it rests on the floor, how the sculpture rests on the plinth. These are all peripheral, yet fascinating issues which relate to the aesthetic aesthetics of the setting and the ambience, complex, fascinating and sensual. This is my métier. So I'm continually working on these things and I'm far from perfect myself. I'm continually striving and experimenting and deplore the fact that these things are treated with such indifference and neglect. Whenever the opportunity arises, he views the works of the great masters. The Albertina in Vienna is currently exhibiting the works of Picasso, Degas and other great masters. It's not my favourite painting. If I didn't know it were genuine, I would say it were a fake. It's so soulless for a Picasso, who is a wonderfully passionate painter. It's very lifeless, very dry, a boring painting in fact. It looks very amateurish. I don't understand the brightness on the upper lip. I don't know why this hand has fingernails and the other one doesn't. It's all a little careless. Then the colour disappears here and then resurfaces behind the red. This rose retreats into the background and becomes spherical and this line is completely on its own. It links up with the red. And here is suddenly the sky. Actually, it looks as if someone had attempted to paint like Picasso. I'm more accustomed to harder, sharper, more defined and more masterful forms from Picasso. This is a very workmanlike piece, not very satisfying. Are you envious? <laughs> How can you be envious of success? That's a very difficult question. So you're not envious? Hardly. I'm far too conceited to be envious. Marcus Lippertz can never be accused of being unduly modest. Degas did sculptures. They're marvellous, like this one of a dancer. This is really the most beautiful, fantastic. 
and he liberates himself from the material and achieves abstraction through this fragmentation, through the perfection of the torso. This is something I strive for with my Mozart perfection, through omission as it were, and that's a stunning and masterful example. Fantastic. After 1982 and 1996, the third Lupert's retrospective is being staged in Vienna in 2006. His entire oeuvre now encompasses some 15,000 works. My successes are partial successes, are steps which I've climbed laboriously. I'm a long way from achieving unconditional admiration or being able to work without compromise. In a certain sense, I'm still an underground artist. My art has not in any way reached saturation point on the market or even been widely accepted. I've achieved legendary status, but my works are still provocative. They shock people. They're rejected. I've remained a pure artist. I'm not yet a brand. I'm not a commodity which sells well. His blackbirds are integrated into colourful cages. Lupatz is expressive, abstract, spontaneous and yet controlled. He's obsessed by abstraction and always creates a juxtaposition between object and form. Here is his 54-part large format work, The Painter's Dream, a kaleidoscope of the history of art from 1996. Thirty years previously, he created one of his most famous works, the Westwall. The Westwall was not an attempt to come to terms with the past or the war. It was an existential relic which still existed at the time I painted it in the Eiffel region. My green paintings were not about the Third Reich, they're not political, they're atmospheric. Vienna, Berlin, Dusseldorf or Florence, regardless of where Lupertz is, he draws on everyday events to provide the themes for his paintings. My themes are like a diary. They document what is preoccupying me at any particular time. I might read something in the morning newspapers or see a fascinating face. I may suddenly see a hand, a dog, a sunset, an abstract form, a blotch, simply anything. For me, there is no content. The content evolves or is articulated through the image, through its interpretation, and that's precisely a function of time, of the future, or of the past. I don't know which, and it's not important. The image must only exist as an image, as an intensive explosion of colour, as an application of colour, as a door to something incomprehensible. A painting should inspire. It's infused with the ideas of the time in which it's created. This can be in the present or can be in 200 years' time. We must abandon the idea that paintings illustrate something. They don't. Paintings are doorways, windows through which one peers and observes time by means of learning and interpreting the signposts, the signals, and even the pitfalls. Consequently, a painting has validity well into the future or even eternity. Every image we look at today must contain things, regardless of whether it's two or three centuries old, which we understand and transport into the present. If that isn't the case, we forget them. Photography doesn't have this quality. Photography is only about the present, about today. It possesses no mysteries or distortions. It has no errors, no interruptions, no access, no corrections, and therefore one day will no longer be understood because it's become history. One doesn't get the impression that you're a modest man or that you maintain a low profile. Quite the opposite. Look, the only life we have is the one we're living. We have no information about whether there's life after death. As we don't possess this information, all we have are these 60, 70, 80, 90 or 100 or so years. And of course, you could just grit your teeth and endure them, hide in a corner and see out your time. That's one possibility. 
I say that without any criticism. That's fine for those who need it. But one can also perceive life as a challenge. To what extent can I master my life, shape it into the form I like? It's pointless to live life as it is. Who is interested in doing that? Are you interested in the truth? No. The truth is the most stupid and simplistic form of communication. It's utterly unimportant. I am interested in the idea, the atmosphere. I am interested in what man creates. Take, for example, religion. There's no God. God is what man has created. God is the greatest, the most beautiful. He's what we imagine our ideal to be, what we'd like to be. So man found and invented God, and everyone agreed on what God should look like. And that's one of mankind's greatest achievements. It spawned a thick book, inspired truths which never existed. It's conjured worlds, miracles which never existed, perpetuating these myths until they became credible. That's a thousand times more valuable than the truth. And that is the product of interpretation. No, of willpower, of stories and of assertions. The world we perceive is related by the tellers of fairy stories, be they the apostles or the brothers Grimm. There lies the truth. The only truth in life is that you are born and that you die. And that isn't very much. The opening is well attended, attracting fans, art connoisseurs and even his friend, Germany's former Chancellor Gerhard Schröder. The homage to Mozart in Vienna, a highlight, in Salzburg, a debacle. You understand that Mozart, or the sculpture, is not a portrait of Mozart, but rather Mozart as a muse. But be honest, isn't it fascinating? Does Marcus Lupertz need the scandal so that people talk about what he's been doing? No, the scandals hinder my quest for perfection, and I only do perfection, not scandals. But he cannot avoid the scandals. His Mozart sculpture in front of St. Mark's Church on Salzburg's Ursulinenplatz has been tarred and feathered. And it's not only churchgoers who've taken offence. Protest letters have flooded in from everywhere. The master himself is undertaking the restoration work. What have the people got against Lupertz? I'm too handsome. And what about the sculpture itself? Surely not. The public can no longer appreciate modern art due to the general dumbing down process which is taking place. People don't understand art anymore. They just want their Mozart confectionery. The whole city is drowning in this junk. If that's what they want, then the sculpture should be removed. They simply don't deserve it. Have you ever wondered if you come across as a little arrogant? I'm not arrogant at all. I'm an honest and hard-working artist who applies his genius to create great art. And if people want to stop me, if they insist on misunderstanding me, then that's their business. But I don't have to play along. Here's the first injury, and here are two, three, four others. Now, where's the fifth? It's on the leg, isn't it? Stefan, can you drum up a cup of coffee from somewhere? I don't know. I'll ask Peter to go. They're doing everything they can to prevent me from painting him. You know why? Due to the aggressiveness of the white face. That shocked people. 
But during the Rococo period, everyone was walking around with white powder on their faces. Public art always sparks fierce debate, something the picture frame dealer, Gunther, has experienced firsthand. Both mother and son are still surprised by the public's reaction. Have you benefited from Herr Lupatz? Yes, it's revitalized the square. There are far more people around Ozulinen Square than before. In summer there are always a few tourists, but now Salzburgers themselves come here to look at the square, or rather the Lupatz statue. When you pass by of an evening, people are standing there just like in summer. It was amusing to see them there at 10 o'clock in the evening when I was going home in heated discussion with each other. Now people stop to gaze, not just at the church and the facades, but at the statue and the text written on it. And they admire it, or at least look at it. So ultimately there's no such thing as bad publicity and Salzburg is now benefiting from Lupatz. Yes, you could say that. This is going down in history. I keep a diary and Salzburg is going to take some flack. And when my diaries are finally published, it will become known as the city where sculptures are tarred and feathered. <laughs> Welcome to the Middle Ages. What do you think of the Mozart? Well, I don't like it. Not exactly beautiful, is it? I'm not trying to run Mozart down or even show Mozart as he really was. That doesn't interest me. The sculpture is quite obviously a message. The physiognomy recalls the time of Mozart by virtue of the wig. Then this idealized face is simply my own depiction of a great and brilliant mind. Other than that, it has nothing to do with Mozart. The entire work is redolent of Mozart's time and aesthetic values. This is a compliment to the great artist who has informed my own artistic development. And this juxtaposition is exciting. People must appreciate that this is a modern work. And if they don't, well, I can't help them. Working for immortality, what more fitting venue could there be for such a venture than inside a church? Cologne's Romanesque St. Andreas Church commissioned Marcus Lupatz to design a window. For him, a very special challenge. Here too, abstraction and realism combine in striking dynamic colours. Even the priest's cassock is authentic Lupatz. Damen und Herren, 
Ladies and gentlemen, to stake his very minor claim to immortality, the artist is dependent upon the fact that in his lifetime he creates permanent, immovable things. And therefore, a church window is ideal, because once installed, the window is very heavy and difficult to remove. As marvelous as it is to be hung in a museum, having an artwork in a church is certainly one of the most rewarding moments and tasks an artist can have. That is why today you're witnessing a very contented artist. I thank you. From the altar to the stage, Fahrenheit 451 is set in a totalitarian state in which books are banned, confiscated and destroyed. Four hundred and fifty one degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature at which books burn. The play was produced by Bonn Theatre and performed in Bonn's Bundeskunsthalle. The stage set and the costumes were designed by Markus Lupatz. Opera, theatre and concert – all fields Lupert loves working in. The small village of Freundenberg in the region of Westphalia, situated between Dortmund and Unna, and far removed from the urban art scene. Exhibiting in a former blacksmith's is not an everyday occurrence for Luppertz. Convinced of the ineluctable appeal of his exhibits, he's prepared to choose offbeat venues. Here there are no minimalistic white walls. Twenty-five fragile plaster casts struggle to take pride of place among machinery, furnaces and lengths of chain. Hence the title of the exhibition, 25 plaster casts at the blacksmiths, all associated with the theme of Mozart. And this is a new variation on Mozart Salieri. He was Mozart's chief adversary, a real bastard who was always plotting against him at court, hence the cynical expression. <laughs> Lights out. Regardless of the venue, a makeshift museum or a high temple of art, Lupatz's meticulously staged appearances are highly authentic. Rather than residing in an ivory tower, he's open and the very antithesis of the scatterbrained, eccentric artist destined for a life of solitude. As an artist, he is honest. He carefully nurtures his various incarnations. The dandy, the prince of painters, the entertainer, the man about town the bohemian and the narcissist, in order to amuse and provoke his media-savvy public. The idea for using a blacksmith's as an exhibition venue came from his brother, Karl Heinz Lupatz, the very opposite of Marcus. He lives in Freudenberg and is an entrepreneur. What are the essential features distinguishing the two of you? The key difference is that he is an artist and I'm an engineer. Since the age of 14, I've worked in industry as an entrepreneur, and he is an artist. Are you a little envious of him? 
No, not at all. We meet up every half year or so. But during the preparations for this exhibition, we've been able to see more of each other. Are you proud of him then? Yes, I am. Without doubt. Proud of having such a brother. As kids, we argued a lot, of course, but today we get on very well. Marcus is well acquainted with the hard grind of a blacksmith's from his childhood. Born in 1941 in Nibirec in Bohemia, the seven-year-old fled with his parents and his 18-month-old brother to the Rhineland. He's earned his own livelihood since the age of 15. Parallel to his studies at the College of Applied Arts in Krefeld, he worked as a coal miner, a navvy, a painter and decorator, a farmhand and as a graphic designer. At the age of 20, he enrolled at the Dusseldorf Academy of Art, from which he was sent down following a fight. Since then, he's worked as a freelance artist. At the age of only 35, he was appointed professor at the Karlsruhe Academy, and at 45, he took up a teaching post in Dusseldorf. In 1987, he was appointed vice-chancellor of the Dusseldorf Academy of Art, and has become an outspoken critic of the politician's empty promises. It's madness. We have museums operating on a procurement budget of 20,000 euros a year. They've built museums and suddenly there's no money. To stage an exhibition in a museum nowadays, we have to finance it ourselves. Where's the much vaunted cultural landscape? It's there where it ultimately belongs, and I've no objections in the private sector. That's all well and good. But politicians shouldn't try and portray themselves as sponsors of the arts. Their policies are promoting something very different, namely youth culture. They're youth-orientated, new and democratic. Youth always means no name, no personality, just movements and masses. And these policies are promoted in a rather casual manner. So they can always claim they've created opportunities for young people, which is just bullshit. This is happening everywhere. Once a year, the Academy stages a public open day for the students to show their work. Participating in this exhibition is Lupertz's friend and colleague, Jörg Immendorf, who's suffering from amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. Hello, my dear friend. Your class is the best today. These are the most exciting. They've done great work, in my opinion. Excellent. No, really, I mean that sincerely. It's fantastic. Looks great. Of course, they're all first-year students, so we'll have to wait and see. But their work is good. Nice to see you here. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to welcome you to the exhibition. There's a great coming and going, which at the same time is causing this building to bleed from all its openings, yet devour and digest everything. The Academy is pulsating with expectation and it's throwing open its doors for this exhibition. It abounds with fresh talent and ideas. I'm delighted that so many of you have found your way here to see what we have done. Many thanks. And such occasions always raise the same question. Can art be taught? Is it artists or still students exhibiting here? That's what I criticize about them, that they behave like students rather than artists. They delude themselves that they're studying something. Rubbish. You can't study here, you have to be here. Here, each student faces keen competition and has to establish his or her own set of standards as an artist, as demonstrated by the class taught by Jörg Immendorf. Immendorf himself enjoys an amicable rivalry with Marcus Lupatz. It may sound cliché, but I cannot imagine a closer relationship over so many decades. 
And that's why we've described our relationship as that of blood brothers, although we've never actually exchanged blood. But those with enough imagination will understand what is meant. Is he a rival? Due to his artistic standards, we have a constructive rivalry. I also felt provoked by his sculptural genius, my term, not his. I'm no sculptor, so I was terribly anxious because he's so prodigious in this field. And in that sense, he is a competitor, because he stimulates me. What is the point of a friendship which yields nothing? There is a healthy rivalry. The friendship is thriving and fills us with life. Belebt die Freundschaft und füllt sie mit Leben. In addition to Karlsruhe, Florence and Dusseldorf, Lupertz also has a studio in Berlin. Here he's working on a large-scale commission, the 10-meter-high Mercury sculpture, planned for the post office tower in Bonn. Before the messenger of the gods takes shape, many drawings and designs have to be made. Lupertz travels frequently to Berlin, where he relishes the change of atmosphere. His time at the Dusseldorf Academy is possibly drawing to an end. I enjoy the academy itself, but these young people, maybe I'm not old enough for them. They really get on my nerves, and that's why I should think about stopping, because I feel that they bore me. Maybe it's my age or not, I don't know. Why should it always be my fault? Perhaps someone else is to blame. But today's young people have a different concept of art, or even of life in general. They don't know what art is. I miss the poets, I miss the lunatics, I miss the eccentrics. I see a vast army of citizens striving to fashion a comfortable life through their creativity, but not through their art. And that's a problem for me, because I can't see any real passion for painting. Of course, this doesn't apply universally, and fascinating new movements are always emerging in painting, but perhaps they're passing me by at the moment. Vielleicht geht die momentan an mir vorbei, das kann ja sein. Also insofern, ich sehe da keine... I feel like an underground artist. I feel, and this may sound silly, young and fresh, and would like to make a new start. But then I'm confronted by these young people obsessed with video and photography, which seems so limited to me. Perhaps they live in a different world. And that's why after 30 years at the academy, it's not surprising, I sense I may not be in the right place. He's certainly at the right place here, sitting around the breakfast table with his family who often travel up from Karlsruhe to spend the weekend with him in Berlin. So if I've understood that correctly, there is the house in Berlin, this studio, and then there's the main residence in Karlsruhe and the studio in Dusseldorf. And where do you prefer to be? Where does Marcus like to be best? There, where my family is. <laughs> First comes his art, then the family. A reality his family accepts and understands. This is Mercury, his largest sculpture to date, which he is busily moulding, hammering, sawing and modelling. Creating this work is also a struggle between form and content. This is his third plaster cast, but not until he's absolutely sure will he send the plaster cast to the foundry. Mercury will take up one year of his life until the bronze figure is finally erected. Art is like drawing breath. Art is like watering a flower. Forget to do it once and the flower dies. But I don't perceive that as work or pleasure. These are God's fingers breathing down my neck. 
I have to be permanently on the move, like a puppet whose strings are being continually pulled. Either you make it or you don't. You can't do anything else other than what you do. You're always swimming against the tide, the world, the public, the collectors, the museums. Maybe I am the real deal and they're wrong, or maybe not. Of course, there are people who allow me free reign, and as such, I have no reason to complain. After all, I'm in a position to create such a thing, aren't I? Critics use the word insignificant to describe something an artist is in the process of making. But from what perspective? That's what they said about Courbet and Van Gogh. They even said it about early Picasso. Someone somewhere thought his work was rubbish, and he went down in history as a rubbish critic. Anyone wishing to attack me is also destined to go down in history as a failure because he knows nothing about contemporary art. That's his risk, and he has to bear the consequences. Being surrounded by his family in the studio is a rare occurrence. The children love the studio ambiance and their father loves having them around. Marcus Lupatz has a very close relationship to his five children. Work on Mercury is interrupted by collectors arriving in his other Berlin studio to buy some paintings. As usual on such occasions, the master is attired in the finest suit. In Berlin, Marcus Lippertz is also well represented. Five of his sculptures adorn the city's public spaces. The most prominent is located in the Federal Chancellor's Office, built by the architect Axel Schulters. Lupertz's sculpture, the female philosopher, has transformed the official reception hall for state guests into a cultural highlight. A keen admirer of his work was and is the former Federal Chancellor Gerhard Schröder. His love of art helped forge a close friendship with Marcus Lupertz and they meet up socially three or four times a year. Marcus Lüppertz. Marcus Lüppertz. What does he mean to you? Well, I find the sobriquet Prince of Paint is very apposite in his case. Often such labels are wrong, but this one is very apt. What he means to me. He's an unbelievably generous person, and as a friend he's very loyal. And of course, as a painter and sculptor, he's very important. But he's no modernist, and neither is he living in the past. He lives his life as he sees fit and attaches great importance to that, and that's as he should be. I just wish him a lot more time to live, not only to paint. I'd like to introduce my wife, my daughters and my son. Preparations for a small exhibition in Istanbul, selecting the paintings with the curator.
80 by 1 meter, they're all the same format, and the gallery price is $50,000. Und der Galeriepreis ist 50.000 Dollar. Unlike her father, 10-year-old Lily is able to take piano lessons. Education commands a high priority in the Lupertz household. However, it's no guarantee for artistic success. Art demands obsession. From Berlin to Bad Reichenhall to a free jazz concert, Lupertz relishes the opportunity of appearing in concert with top professional musicians four or five times a year. Is jazz a release from painting? It's another word for it. It's also the shortest path to achieving happiness. From Bad Reichenhall to London, to yet more preparations for an exhibition, Lupertz lived here some 30 years ago and has already exhibited here. Meanwhile, new museums and galleries have sprung up all over the city. The Tate, one of the world's most distinguished exhibition venues, would be a welcome challenge for him. Are the opportunities for exhibiting and selling works better than ever before? No, yeah. Not that really. There have always been opportunities because the genre has kept expanding. Consequently, the quantity of art has grown considerably due to the greater access to information and the greater popularization of art. There are simply far more people on the planet nowadays. But the systems and the availability haven't changed, and the present is always the best time because it's the only one we can experience. And eventually it will have passed and our time here will be at an end. We live and die in our own time. We're the custodians of our time and we must ensure we do something decent with it. Isn't that a terrible prospect of one day not being here anymore and never returning? That applies to others, but not to me. So Marcus Lupertz has achieved immortality through his paintings? That's beyond question. But let's not talk about death. It isn't going to happen. 